Hi, welcome to Board Gems. In this video series, I'd like to cover older board games and talk about whether they are still gems today or not. Most of them were gems at the very least back in the day. And games don't stop being good just because time passes. But over time, you can kind of get a fuller picture of, of where the game stands historically and whether it's still worth playing today. The game I'm covering today is Leonardo da Vinci, which was originally published by Da Vinci Games in, I think, 2006 by the Italian design group Akitoka. Akitoka is how in Italian you would ask, who's next? Whose turn is it? It's an early worker placement game. So if you've seen my video on Pillars of the Earth, this is kind of contemporary to that. It's for two to five players, ages 12 and up. I agree with that. It's a bit involved. And the box says 60 to 90 minutes. Yeah, that's a fair range for a three or four player game. Uh, I would say an experienced four players or kind of newish three players, not counting the rules explanation, would probably be in the 90 minute range. The twist on worker placement in Leonardo da Vinci is that more so than in other games, they really feel like simultaneous multiple auctions. You have a double strength worker as well as multiple weaker one value workers. And you're taking turns putting them in various locations, but multiple players can be in multiple locations at the same time. What matters is how many workers are there and the order that they came in, with an important caveat, an important restriction being that those weak workers, once you put a certain number of weak workers in, and you can choose how many on your turn, how many of those workers to put in a particular space, but once you do that, you can't put any more in that space. So it really feels like a bid to use that space. But multiple players can make use of the space for increasing cost. A new version of this came out in 2023 by Dice Tree Games, uh, with developments by Dice Tree's founder, Chung Hyun Baek. And that game is called Codex Luster. Well, Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Luster. It is the same game fundamentally. Um, really develops more, adds a lot more details, and makes it more what you might expect from a modern Euro. I have a separate video on how to play Codex Luster. In this video, I'll show you how to play Leonardo da Vinci, then I will talk about whether I think it's still a gem or not, and I will, of course, compare to the changes in Codex Luster. To set up the game, place the board on the table between the players. These small cards, some of them are resources. You don't shuffle these. Instead, you'll place them as a deck on the matching icon. So you'll see here this metal. This icon matches that icon. So we're gonna put those here. In this game, money is in the form of cards, numbered one, five, 10, 20. So you're going to put all the cards of a particular denomination and put them on the matching space on the board. And we're actually going to take one florin and I'm going to put it on this space here. This space is going to get one florin added every round. Now we prepare the inventions deck. There are four strengths, values of inventions, bronze, copper, silver, and gold. So we're going to prepare the inventions deck. There's 10 gold inventions numbered 16 to 25. Take the ones numbered 21 to 25. Mix them up as best you can here. These will always be on the bottom of the inventions deck. With the remaining gold, add three silver, two copper, and one bronze. Shuffle that up, place on top of the deck here. And the remaining silver, copper, and bronze cards, mix those together, put that on top. And then reveal a number based on number of players. It's one more than the number of players up to a maximum of five. 
So three for a two player game, five for a four or five player game. I'm gonna set it up for a three player game. Let's look at the anatomy of an invention. This number is how many research weeks your laboratory needs to perform in order to complete that invention, in this case seven. This shows the resources that you need to start the invention. And if you complete the invention, you will use up those resources. The coin shows the benefit in money, and money is victory points, for completing the invention. If you are the first or tied for the first player to complete the invention, you will get the larger number in Florence, in this case eight. If you complete this invention on a later round, you'll get the lesser number, six. And finally, each invention shows one of five symbols. At the end of the game, you will get bonus points for having a variety of these symbols, but also during the game, for every symbol that you collect, future inventions of that same symbol have a discount of work weeks. If you already have an invention of this symbol, then when you complete this invention, you subtract two work weeks. So it only takes five work weeks in order to complete this invention. If you have two of these, it would only take three. Place the mechanical men on this space. You technically only need three per player. Each player can only have three. Keep the arrows nearby. One marker goes on the round space. There are seven full rounds and two abbreviated rounds in which you will just do research toward completing inventions. And this marker can go on this price chart here. I'll explain how that works later. There's two player aids, so distribute them such that each player has access to them. It can be useful to know what inventions are in the deck, what might be coming up soon. Each player gets one master, three apprentices, and two markers to show progress in your laboratories. Each player has two laboratories, but you only start with one. This laboratory has room for three workers on one side, five on the other, and you notice one space shows an optional mechanical man. A second laboratory shows four on one side and six on the other. Each player immediately gets their three worker workshop in front of them, but the four goes here and it's possible to get that later in the game. A player's remaining apprentices go here in the academy. Each player also gets one money card of value zero in their color. Now determine a start player. The start player will get the Leonardo marker. Play is clockwise after that. Now you're going to take turns choosing a starting benefit from a menu. It's on the back of the rule books. If you play this way regularly, you might want to print this out to give everybody uh, their own list that they can choose from. But each player will start with a certain number of favors. Favors are starting benefits. In a two player game, each player will get one. In a three player game, each player gets two. And in a four or five player game, each player gets three, but they can't have the same one more than twice. And there are four different flavors of favor. One favor, take five florins from the bank. A second favor is you can start with some components in hand. You choose any four, although no more than two of a particular single type. A third favor is you can take an extra apprentice and add it to your supply here. And the fourth possible favor is at the workshop. At the workshop, you can get mechanical men. I will explain how that works, but you need a place in your workshop for a mechanical man. And right now you don't have any space in your workshop for a mechanical man. Mechanical men only go into these spaces. So you'll need to upgrade. As a favor, you can either take a mechanical man, assuming you have a place in your laboratory for the mechanical man. If not, you can't take one. Or you can upgrade your existing laboratory from three to five, or you can take your four worker lab, or if you already took that as a previous favor, you can upgrade it to the six worker side. If you upgrade your workshop, either get a new one or upgrade one you already have, 
you also can take a free component of your choice. So in clockwise order, starting with Leonardo, each player chooses one favor, then chooses a second favor, if it's a three player game, and if it's a four or five player game, a third favor. You just can't pick the same favor three times. Keep in mind that any activity you do that involves the workshop is considered the same favor. So you could not get your four workshop, upgrade it, and take a mechanical man. Even though those you could consider those as three separate things, but they're all the same type of favor. So the four possible favors are get five florins, get four components, but at max two of any particular type, or get an apprentice, or do something involving this space. <laughs> and then you're ready to begin, starting with round one. The winner of the game is the player who has the most money. You will spend money during the course of the game, but of course you want to make money. And the main way of making money in the game is by completing inventions. This icon on the bottom and the numbers next to it show how much money you will get if you complete that particular invention. In this case, eight, if you are the first or tied for the first player to complete it. In this case, six, if you complete it on a later round. In order to work on an invention, you have to assign the invention to one of your possible two laboratories. And this is done at the start of every round. The round consists of four phases. First is choosing what your laboratories do, then sending your workers, your master and your apprentices out either onto the main board or into your laboratories to perform research. Then evaluate all the workers, they all do their actions, and then revealing which laboratories possibly have completed inventions and getting the rewards for it. So the first thing that happens in a round, starting with the player who has a Leonardo marker, that's the start player, for every laboratory you have, you can choose what that laboratory does. You can let a laboratory do nothing with the hope of upgrading it. You can only upgrade a lab if it's not working on anything. But in order to work on an invention, you need components. These are the components that this invention needs, glass and metal. If you have these components in your hand, you can decide to start working on an invention. You will take the cards, don't show it to anybody, arrange them so people can't see how many cards are there, tuck them under your lab, and then place one of your markers on the hammer, the zero space. This numbered track indicates how many research weeks the lab has performed on this invention. You know that this lab is working on this invention. You know that because of the resources that are underneath it. Each invention requires a different combination of resources. Other players know that lab is doing something, but they don't know which invention. In fact, it is possible even to work on inventions that are still coming out. You can do that because it's possible over the course of the game to look at the next few cards that are about to come out. Or you can take a chance by looking to see what inventions have yet to come. So you can work on anything, but the lab cannot complete the invention unless the card is face up in this row. Excuse me for a minute, I adjusted the board so that you can see the entire workshop and also fix this because it's. I've set it up for a three player game so there should be four inventions visible. <laughs> then, second phase of the game is players will send their workers out to perform work. There's two types of workers. You have one master and you have three or more apprentices. Each master is worth two apprentices. Workers can either go into your lab on these spaces, at which point they will perform work, research toward this invention, or you can send them out onto the board. Whatever you do, you must decide on a location, one of your possibly two labs or any of these locations on the city board, choose either your master or one or more of your apprentices. Take those and place them on the space with the letter, if it's in the city. If it's in your lab, you'll just put one on every space. You are limited to the number of spaces that are physically on your lab. If you place it in a city space, if you're the first player in that location, place them close to the arrow. Otherwise, put them to the other side. So you can always see who placed first. 
Importantly, once you place apprentices in a location, you cannot place any more apprentices there this round, but you can later place your master. In the next phase, when you're uh, about to perform the work, you'll look and see who has the most strength of workers. You're going to add up your apprentices and possibly your master, which is worth two, and whoever has the highest value, the highest total, will be able to perform the action first and cheaper. If it's a tie, then you go in order from placed earlier to placed later. I'll give you an example of how that works. Just remember that once you choose to put apprentices in a location, you cannot put any more apprentices there later this round. Starting with Leonardo and going clockwise, each player picks one location either on the board or one of their labs and either places their master or one or more apprentices. That's all they do on their turn. Play continues clockwise. Players place the rest of their apprentices somewhere else in a different location perhaps. Maybe they decide to put their master. On your turn you put either your master or one or more apprentices. And you keep going until all workers have been placed. It is possible to get more workers. Some players may have more workers than others, at which point they might be taking multiple turns while you're done. <laughs> but that's the assignment phase. And after the assignment phase, then we resolve. Let me show you an example. If at the end of the assignment phase, so now we're actually going to be performing the work, it looked like this, red would go first because red has a total of three. In this case, green and blue are tied for two. So green would go next, because green placed their apprentices earlier, and then blue would go last. So let's talk about the different locations and what they do. You start on the city board, and you start with A, the council. Then we'll go B, workshop, C, academy, and then D through H, the shops in which you get components. The council is a little bit unique in that, in a three or more player game, if all players have gone to the council, whoever has the lowest total, in this case blue, is last in the ranking, has to remove their workers and they get no benefit. That's not the case at the other locations, but at the council that's the case. In a three or more player game, not everybody can take advantage of the council. First, the player who is ranked highest at that location chooses who will get the Leonardo marker. This is a start player marker. It can be good to go earlier because you'll break ties, but it can also be good to go later because you can see what other players are doing. So you, the player who's ranked highest first chooses who the start player will be going forward. Then in ranked order, each player chooses one of these benefits. The player will take their markers, their workers, and place them on one of the four spaces. And each player, will do that. And then after every player has done that, then we resolve. Each player must choose a different benefit. This benefit allows you to move a single apprentice. You can even move an apprentice that's at the council if you want. And you move them to somewhere else on the city board. You can't move it to your laboratory. If you already have workers there, you can just slot them into the same position. So that'll change the strength there. This location you get to take all the florins that are in this space. There starts with one, we add one every round. This benefit, you draw the top four inventions from this deck, look at them, and then put them back on top of the deck in any order you like. So you can see which inventions are coming up and you can start working on inventions that are not yet visible, but you know they're coming. You just can't complete them until they're face up. The fourth benefit is you can buy any of the five, any single resource for one floor. That's the council. Then we evaluate B through H. And this costs money, potentially. So let, let's put our workers back here. Let's say, let's say again, it looked like this. So again, red would go first, then green, then blue. Each location B through H on the board has a particular benefit that you can choose. And it grants that benefit up to four times. The first time is free. After that, two florins, three florins, four florins. Only up to four times. Starting with the player who ranked highest, they may get one of the benefits at that location 
for free. In this case, it would be either get a mechanical man, if they have space on their workshop right now, you can't take a mechanical man and hold on to it for later, or you can get your second laboratory, or you can upgrade one of the laboratories you already have. So let's say Red decides they're going to upgrade their laboratory, their three to their five. Red stays on this space. We move the marker and now it's Green's turn. Green may decide to get one of these benefits, but they'd have to pay two Florence. Let's say Green decides to get their second workshop. In this case, it would always be the lower number first. This is four, this is six. This is the upgraded side. So when they first get this, they'll get the four side and they'll put it with their other laboratory and they pay two florins to the bank. And now it's three. Let's suppose this is too expensive for blue. Blue decide, or they don't have the money. Blue decides not to. You don't have to get the benefit. Blue could get one of these same benefits for three florins or pass. If a player passes, they take their workers back. This marker stays where it is. And now we return. Blue was last, so now we start again at first. Red is first. Red may get a second benefit for three florins. Well, they upgraded their laboratory. Maybe they take a mechanical man. I'll explain mechanical men in a bit when we talk about performing research. But mechanical men can only go on spaces that show worker or mechanical men. And red would pay three florins. Then we move to four. Let's say that's too expensive for green. Green backs out. Green takes their workers back. This marker stays at four. Red may get yet another benefit, this time paying four florins. So there are four benefits to be had, and we check in ranked order, giving each player an opportunity to get that benefit, and each benefit costs more than the time the bene a benefit was taken earlier. First place always gets it for free, assuming they take the benefit for free, then the second player may get the benefit for two florins, they can pass. Importantly, if they pass, the price marker does not move. There is still a second benefit available for two florins for the next player. If red was the only player there, they could get all four benefits. They would pay nine florins, which is quite expensive, but they could do it, but only up to a maximum of four. If red decides, yep, I'm going to pay four florins and I'm going to get my second workshop, my second laboratory, red is still there, but at this point, all four benefits have been claimed. So this space is now done. We reset this to zero and the players take all their remaining workers and we start again at the next location. Four benefits, increasing cost. At this location, players can take an extra apprentice. And at each of these shops, players can take one component, one resource for that location. So D is the metal, E is the glass, and so on. If multiple players are here, the first player would get one medal for free. Then the next player in ranked order may buy a medal for two florins and three and so on. That's how these are evaluated. Finally, we evaluate any workers that are in a workshop. After we resolve the city, then we resolve our labs. For each apprentice that we've assigned to our lab, we gain one work week. For every master, we gain two work weeks. For every mechanical man, you get two work weeks. These mechanical men do work automatically. So once you get a mechanical man, they're just always performing research on your behalf. You don't have to assign workers to the lab, but you can in order to perform more work. <laughs> So all players move their markers on their labs based on research done by the workers and possibly mechanical men at that location. Then is the fourth phase of a round, which is seeing if anybody's completed an invention. In this case, Blue has not. Blue is working on this invention, which takes seven work weeks, and they're only at five. 
Other players don't know that. Other players might think that they were working on this one, at which point they'd be done by now. They've completed five work weeks, they only needed four. They would be done. So again, starting with Leonardo, each player reveals whether they have completed an invention. So if, for example, Blue did complete their invention, they would reveal their resources. These will go back into their piles in a second, but just leave them here for now to show which invention that they have completed. Because any of the players may be working on the same invention. So don't take this card yet. You would immediately get the higher number of florins, in this case, eight florins. And all the players in clockwise order do the same. If they've completed the same invention, they would still get the larger number because they all completed them at the same time. Then one player is going to get the card. The card is a benefit for two reasons. One, it offers a discount of two work weeks for future inventions of the same type. So if later on, Blue had this card and they wanted to work on another invention with the symbol, they would be completed once their work marker reached five instead of seven. And that compounds, if they have two, then it would be two weeks per invention they've already completed. So it's good to get symbols of the same type, but you get bonus points if you get symbols of different types, which I'll explain at the end. So one player is going to get this card. Which player? Well, all the players that are involved in the tie do a secret bid. They take money cards from their hand, and this is why players have a zero. They take a certain number of money cards in their hand and put them face down in front of them. And when all the tied players have done that, all the players who have finished the invention at the same time, after they've all done that, then they reveal. If everybody bids zero, nobody gets the card. It just goes out of the game. Otherwise, the highest bidder will get the card and pay the florins. The other players get their bids back. They don't lose them. If it's a tie, ties are resolved in turn order, starting with Leonardo being the first tiebreaker and then clockwise from there. Let's suppose a player completes an invention and another player was working on that invention, but they hadn't yet finished it. That's okay. They can keep working on, an in on the invention that they've already started. You can't start working on an invention that someone else has already completed, but if you had already started the invention, you can finish it. In this case, you would reveal the resources to show that that is the invention that you're working on. Now everybody knows your, that lab is working on that invention. And you would take an arrow and point it to the player to remind you which invention you're working on. Later on, when you complete the invention, you will get the lesser number in Florence. After inventions are claimed and resources go back into their piles, then that's the end of the round. Add a florin to this space, refill this row, so there's the correct number of inventions for the number of players, in this case four for a three-player game, and then move the marker to the next round and start again with deciding what each of your labs does. You will do this seven times. The eighth and ninth rounds are abbreviated. In the eighth and ninth rounds, players do not send their workers to the city at all. They can send all their workers to their labs with the intention of completing inventions they've already started. This is a way to complete the really big inventions that would take like 15 work weeks. In these rounds, you can start working on new inventions, but you won't have any opportunities to get more components, so you will have already had to have them by the end of the seventh round. In the eighth and ninth rounds, you can simply decide what your labs are doing, assign your workers to your labs, and perform research towards completing inventions. That's all you do in rounds eight or nine. At the end of the ninth round, players will get bonus points based on the variety of different symbols. If they have three different symbols of inventions, they get a bonus of eight points, eight florins, money. If they have four different symbols, they get 13. And if they have five different symbols, they get 20. And the player with the most florins wins. In the case of a tie, it's the player who completed the most inventions 
And if that's a tie, the player who completed the most gold-colored inventions. And if that's a tie, the player with the most silver. And so on. That's it. You're ready to play Leonardo da Vinci. It's an auction game. I'd say it's more of an auction game than a worker placement game, at least as we now think of worker placement, right? Like standardized by Agricola. That, you know, there's a particular spot and a player can put a worker in that spot and get the benefit, but then nobody else can go into that spot until the later round. In this game, all players can put multiple workers in spots. And that number of workers ends up being their bid to use that spot earlier and cheaper. And the fact that money is involved, you're bidding on workers, and the more workers you have in there, the cheaper it is to do the action, almost reverses that sort of, you know, I want to spend lots of money to win the auction. Well, it's like, no, you want to spend lots of workers to win the auction so that you spend less money. <laughs> but money is victory points in this game, which I will say I really appreciate, and more games should do that. Victory points alone, too abstract, right? And, it, and when you have victory points as something abstract, from that develops point salad. Point salad is a natural progression of that, where victory points don't really represent anything except some vague sense of success. So you can judge success on a million different things and give people one victory point, two victory points here and there. But when victory points are money, and you do in fact have to spend money in order to make money, that's always welcome. And it adds value to the auction. Right, you know, in this case, of course, how much you you want to not spend, <laughs> as opposed to how much you're willing to spend in an auction, but the auction is still very, very important, and you can see the value of your money, because you're going to be spending if if you're if you're not doing well in the auction and you're going later in turn order to get the thing that you need, you're going to be spending more money, and that's victory points that you're giving up. I apologize, I have a creaky chair. Worker placement games can be interactive, unless the worker placement game is called A Feast for Odin. This worker placement game feels particularly interactive. I mean, you're able to see the bids of all the players. How many workers does a player have left? You know, they've already put workers there, so they can't put more workers there. I still see they have a bunch of workers, so they're going to go somewhere else. But, oh, the player still has their master. They could drop that in and increase their bid by two. Worker placement as we understand it today, can often deteriorate into not really playing the players you're playing the game. You know, you, you get a plan for the start of the round, right? I want to do this, and then I want to do this, and I want to do that. And if nobody interferes with me, the plan's going to work out great. And somebody interferes with you, not because necessarily they were trying to ruin your plan, but because they had their own plan, and it happened to use the same spaces. So you're just kind of getting in each other's way. But you often don't have to worry about what a, another player's particular strategy is. I mean, that's the case in this game too, because you don't know what other players are working on. That part is secret. But you can see what they have left to work with. What workers they have left that are still about to come out on the board. And you know where they can and can't place workers based on the workers they've already placed. Maybe you don't remember exactly what resources players have collected, but you can see what workers they have yet to play, where they've already played them, and you know which areas you can kind of worry about being outbid. And even if you're outbid, it's not the end of the world. You will probably still be able to do the action. It will just be more expensive. I like that it can be good to go early or late. So one of the benefits of going to the council and being first in the council is you get to choose a start player for the next round. And it can be advantageous to go early versus late. Early players are going to win tiebreakers, right? Because they get their workers into the space earlier. But later players can see where other players are going and reacting. Oh, I see everybody's going for workers this, this round. Okay, you know what? I'm not going to go for extra workers this round. I'm going to focus on something else, which I can do for cheaper or for free. And, you know, I'll change my strategy 
you know, to work around other players. Everybody is working secretly on their own projects. And you and I may be working on the same project, but we don't know it. We don't have to reveal anything about the project we're working on. So we're competing, but we don't know we're competing. It can be frustrating for a player to keep picking research projects that other players are working on, and they always end up finishing theirs first. <laughs> In general, people are going to be working on their own things, but there is still a lot of interaction on the board competing for the spaces. In my experience, there'll usually be one or two players who are quite far behind the pack, uh, which again may not be a great experience for them. Uh, the game definitely rewards multiple plays. The rules are a pain, especially set up because they introduce the whole game with the sort of normal rules, and at the end they have a, an expert variant. The expert variant is the way to play. Every player gets to choose from a menu of bonuses at the beginning, and the, the preparation of the invention deck is more simple and straightforward. In order to try to create a positive first experience for players, they hold your hands during setup a lot. So the invention deck is very specific. Find these particular cards, put them out. Those bonuses I mentioned, the menu of bonuses that you can start the game with in the expert variant. In the regular variant, in the normal like rules, like if you're just reading the rules like you would normally, that's the way you set up the game. The game chooses those bonuses for each player. So the first player gets these bonuses, second player gets these bonuses, if, if there's a third player, they get these. And this is shown in this tiny little diagram. <laughs> and you're looking at the diagram trying to see like, okay, it looks like purple has an extra apprentice. I want to say starting with the expert rules is the way to go, because it just makes the setup more straightforward. But it is true that players aren't gonna know the menu items, which things are good, which things are bad. But, you know, that's a board game. You know, you're going to make some decisions early in the game, and it turns out it's like, oh, yeah, actually, maybe a different decision in that first turn or something would have been better. But that's part of the learning process, right? Hopefully, you're not playing a game just once. You're playing a game multiple times, and that first game is going to be a little bit of a learning experience. The game isn't much to look at, as you probably noticed. Uh, everything I find is clear. The iconography is clear. The uh, colors are just a bit bland. So I think Leonardo da Vinci would probably be a tough sell among modern hobbyists. Certainly if you were to like show them the box and then people would look at it, maybe they look at the back of the box, it looks like one of those typical generic boring looking Euros. Is it a typical generic boring looking Euro? No but I have caveats recommending it nowadays. To be clear, Leonardo da Vinci is a good game. There are a lot of good games, so we have to be a little bit picky, right? I enjoy my plays of Leonardo da Vinci. If somebody had Leonardo da Vinci and they wanted to play it with me, I'm up for it. Anytime, let's go. But I won't necessarily suggest seeking it out, at least not without the caveats that I've already presented. For example, I would completely ignore the normal setup rules and go straight to the expert variant. Because it's just, it's actually kind of faster to get up and going. There's less setup involved and players are involved in the decisions of what bonuses they get. And that just gets players more involved early. The fact that work is kind of done in secret and then revealed more or less at the same time, you know, when when revealed when inventions are revealed to be completed, all happens at the same time. Uh, does create some tie-breaking wonkiness slightly, because people, players who are tied will all get the higher benefit in terms of money slash victory points, but then they have to do a blind bid to see who actually gets the card. And I do like that the cards, the symbols that you get for completing an invention first. You'll get the card and it has a symbol. And the symbol gives you benefits in two ways and they're opposite ways. The icon will give you a discount on future inventions you build with the same icon during the game. 
But at the end of the game, you will get a bonus in victory points slash money for having different icons. So there's a, a push and a pull, right? I want to get the same icons because that makes in completing inventions of that type much faster to complete. But that end game bonus is not easy to ignore. If you don't care at all about the looks and you just care about how the game plays, then absolutely Leonardo da Vinci is still worth looking at today. Um, I would recommend trying it if you can before seeking out a used copy, but I don't think used copies are very expensive. It's just you have to ask yourself whether you can convince other people to play it with you. <laughs> but it is engaging. Uh, it's interesting. They did a really nice spin on worker placement that makes it more of a, a visual, multifaceted auction. So if you can find it for cheap, I would recommend... And you, if you like worker placement games... Especially work replacement games with a twist. You don't mind the game looks dated. This game looks very dated. And you don't think you'll have a problem convincing other people to play this dated looking game. Then it's definitely a good game still today. And one person who agrees is Chung Hyun Bik, the uh, founder of Dice Tree Games, who has made a new version of Leonardo da Vinci called Leonardo da Vinci's Codex Lester. The fundamental core of the game is almost identical. There are a few major changes. For one thing, now players broadcast to each other which projects they're working on. Instead of all the work being performed at the end of the round and then revealing to see whether it's completed, you perform work during the round, which means ties no longer happen. It's my turn. I put workers into my lab, they perform research, I have completed the invention. Now that can create tension. If you and I are working on the same project, then we're pushing each other to, to uh, place our workers in our lab instead of on the board. Because in the old version, often you put your workers on the board first, because that's where you're competing. And then what you have left, you might put on your on your lab because people can't stop you from putting things in your lab, right? But now there's a, a tension because if you and I are working on the same project, then we're rushing toward completing it. You can see how close I am to completion. You can see how many workers I have left. And you know, it's like on my next turn, if I decide to put all my remaining apprentices in my lab, I will complete that invention first. And that puts pressure on you. So now you want to focus just as much on your own lab and putting workers there early compared to uh, the, the main part of the board where you're competing with other players. That part is interesting and it avoids the wonkiness of having um, sort of a blind bid to determine like, well, who gets the one card? I do find sometimes though that because players broadcast which projects they're working on, it's more likely that players will do their own thing. If you see that I'm working on project A and I've already done some work at it, you are discouraged from starting project A. Now that can be a good thing in the sense that if I finish first, you don't feel like your work has been overly wasted, but it does mean that players kind of separate out, right? I'm working on this, you're working on that. We're still competing. We're competing for workers. We're competing for upgrades to our labs, um, but we're not really competing on the same inventions anymore. But it's just different. It's not better or worse. It is better in the sense that it removes some wonkiness, but that's a fundamental change to Leonardo da Vinci. These changes by in and of themselves to the core of the game are interesting, and I don't have a strong preference between one or the other. I think more modern hobbyists would prefer the newer way over the original way. But in the process of redevelopment, they made a change to the game that, again, will make it more attractive, I think, to modern hobbyists, which is they complexified it. They added more. They added a whole thing about uh, patron favors, which, you know, can be th thematic, you know, patrons in the Renaissance, sure. But again, it's complexity. So there's random benefits. There's random benefits at the council now. So those cycle out. There's random patron benefits that get set up at the start of the game that give you a bonus. 
if you complete a particular uh, milestone on your player board. What happens is because the requests are quite varied and to unlock all of them, you're going to be doing a little bit of everything. You can focus, but then you're not getting as many patron benefits, but maybe you only care about a couple. Then it doesn't matter which ones you do. You pick the ones that kind of match your strategy and then pick the requests that you, th the, uh, the benefits rather, that you think will be uh, most beneficial to you. But if you want to do everything, and you do ideally want to do as much of it as possible because you're also unlocking an extra worker, you're unlocking uh, an extra mechanical man as you progress down the patron rewards track. And now the inventions in Codex Lester, they have uh, special abilities. So if you're the first player to complete an invention, you get the card and the card has a built-in special ability. The new game is more involved. And there is a not tiny subset of hobbyists who feel like more, the more complexity, the better. Give me more things to think about. I want to be overwhelmed with options and possibilities. A lot of hobbyists love that. In general, Codex Lester is Leonardo da Vinci developed into a modern Euro. People who like Euros like at least a default level of complexity. And maybe the original game didn't have enough complexity for modern hobbyists' tastes. And Codex Lester is an excellent development of the game for modern audiences. And even though the board is beige, the artwork is much more detailed and much more welcome. So I would say for most hobbyists today, there's no need to seek out the original Leonardo da Vinci if Codex Lester is available. Now it's a Dice Tree game, it's expensive. Dice Tree provided this copy for free. Um, thank you to Dice Tree. But know that it's a step up in complexity. I'm actually thinking of developing a variant that goes in between. That takes, you take the, the new version, which is the version that I have here and the one that I will be keeping of Codex Lester and removing some of the complexity, maybe removing the patron rewards track, maybe going back to secret uh, working on inventions, because now with the uh, extra deck of multi-purpose cards, you don't have to do the blind bid. Everybody can get the benefit. The player who, who loses the blind bid normally wouldn't get the symbol, but now they can just take the matching symbol from the, uh, from the, from the multi-purpose card deck. So I'm actually thinking of making a variant for Codex Lester to make it simpler, to make it a little bit closer to the original, but that's because I prefer simplicity in games. If you are the type of hobbyist who likes additional complexity and you are curious about Leonardo da Vinci, don't look at it. Don't look at that anymore. Codex Lester is the one you want. I have no complaints about the game from the point of view of a modern Euro. It's just, I'm not a modern Euro kind of guy. And I prefer the more straightforward rule set of Leonardo da Vinci, even though some parts of it are a little wonky. So I feel like the best version is somewhere in between. And thanks for watching. Remember, older games like Leonardo da Vinci do not stop being good because newer games come out. Don't you know? Take care.